This is Andy Perot of Boxing Social in association with Betfred, and I'm delighted to be joined by Matthew Macklin over Zoom. Matt, first and foremost, how are you doing? Not too bad, Andy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting by, mate, getting by. As we've just said off camera, I'm kind of like in that position. I want to get back out, and I'm sure you're the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I'm uh, ready to get back out, ready to get on the tape and the fights, and just missing everyone, missing the boxing. Uh, but look, it is what it is. I've. Uh, I've been running more, uh, been training more in, in that sense, not, not in the gym, but been definitely out on the roads doing a bit of road work and stuff like that, cleaning, doing a few little jobs in the house that I've never done before. So uh, that's been good, sorting stuff out that I keep putting off. So yeah, just uh, staying busy, but like you said, ready to get back to it now, really. Go back to your amateur days. Being a young lad travelling the world, being able to experience all these different cities and, and the culture that would have come with it, What's it like for, for a young lad travelling to all these places with his friends? Unbelievable. Be, be, probably the best days of my boxing was boxing for uh, Young England because, you know, Paul, Paul Smith was on that team with me. Good mate of mine from back in the schoolboy England days. We, you know, me and Paul met on a, a training uh, squad going to South Africa in 98. And uh, I was a team captain on that and Paul was, uh, was on it too. And, you know, me and him clicked, became great mates. When I came back from there, I went up to Liverpool, uh, stayed with him. You know, that, that was 1998, do you know what I mean? That was, we were 16 years old. And, um, you know, to box then, we boxed, we went on, God, we went on many trips together. We were in uh, Sardinia, uh, Hungary, uh, South Africa, there was a few, you know, but we, and, you know, it, it was exciting, do you know what I mean? Like, there were people that you'd have looked up to that, you know, a couple of years old, and then you, you watched in the scoreboard championships, and you, you know, read about them in the box news, and, you know, you read that they'd gone on a trip to Russia or South Africa, and now you're doing it. And it was like, you know, they're the lads your own age, you know what I mean, that you've seen all through the championships. You know, you probably shared their change rooms at the calm, lads, you know, Jimmy Fletcher, Terry Fletcher, good mates of mine from the calm man centre in Bradford. You know, we'd always we'd always kind of meet up with them at the semi-final stage, and you know, the, I boxed one of uh, one of their gym mates, a guy called John Berry, who was you know a really good fighter. I beat him one year in the schoolboy quarterfinals, I think it was. So, you know, we we got to, you get to know each other in the changing rooms, you get talking, and you, you know, you're rooting for each other as well. So it's uh, when, when as you're coming through the ranks, then some filter out. You know, some people give up, some people don't maybe improve as much as you did, or, or maybe disimprove. Um, and other people come join that kind of um, group of lads. But um, I remember that definitely boxing for Young England. Mark Moran, Craig Lyon, Stephen Birch. Really good, really, really good friends of mine. You know, Matthew Thurwell, me and him sparred a lot of rounds at Crystal Palace. They were just, uh, just a brilliant, brilliant time. I used to love the, the squads at Crystal Palace. I mean, they used to drag a bit and you get blisters on your feet and the, the accommodation was shit. You know, this none of this GB stuff up in Sheffield yeah. in that lodge back in Crystal Palace. The food was pucker. I never struggled with my weight really, um, so I could eat what I wanted. It was oh, we always had a good good banter with the lads, good crack. And uh, you know, Calvin Travis was was Nigel Travis's dad was the, was the national coach, and you know, I got on really well with him too. And and all the all the coaches, I loved it. I did the the the, the young England days. Um, I loved. they were probably. The best days of my boxing, if I'm honest. I mean, the professional game was brilliant too, and had some great times and achievements and travel. You know, again, also traveling the world and more luxury. You know, and you know, even things like the wild card being sometimes lonely out in the wild card, and you know, you're stuck in a, a budget type hotel, and you know, once you train in the gym, what are you going to do? Long old day, but but I did want to do that. You know, I was at the wild card because I wanted to be at the wild card. I mean, it was. I remember being out there in 2001. Um, Frank Warren flew me out there to spar with a guy called Roman Karmazan who was actually training to fight Oscar De La Hoya he was Oscar De La Hoya's mandatory challenger and I, I was I hadn't even made my pro debut but I was about to and they threw flew me out there for the experience and um, I remember thinking you know James Tony was sparring in the gym you know you guys like like that out there and I remember thinking oh, I'm, I'm in, and I actually went back out there for a holiday like a training holiday you know, uh, the end of that season, I was 6-0, and uh, did a bit of sparring, um, you know, and it was like, I remember thinking, I'd love to train out here for a fight. And obviously, I did end up training out there with Freddie Roach. 
for a couple of fights. Fred never ended up doing the corner, but you know, I did, I did a couple of camps out there with him. So, you know, all great experience, all things I dreamt of doing that I actually then went on, went on and did. You know, people talk about the law of attraction and see it, believe it, achieve it. I think, you know, my career really, even though it was quite stagnated and different trainers, promoters and stuff, but it, I did kind of dream of all that stuff. You know, I did want to box in America. I did want to box at Madison Square Garden. I did want to box at Las Vegas on HBO. And I did want to train with the, the likes of a Freddie Broach and a Buddy McGirt. You know what I mean? These are people I read about in the ring magazine. I used to, you know, I used to uh, get the bus into town in Birmingham because the gym, uh, Smallie Boxing Club was in Digbeth. So I'd get the bus into town because the gym wouldn't open until 5 half 5 And I'd go and do that Smith and I'd literally, you know, I'd go in and read the ring magazine cover to cover, the boxing news cover to cover. Cause I'd, I'd kill an hour in there, waiting for the gym to open. And I'd, uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the career, when you look back at it now, it was um, beyond my wildest dreams, really. All of it, it amateur and pro. Um, but the, uh, you know, obviously I didn't, I got robbed of that moment and the new world champion, but. I know, I know I was world champion uh, level. I know I got rubbed that night. And even Martinez, it was, uh, he beat me fair and square. But it was a nip and tuck fight. Go, I, was, I was three rounds up on the one card going into the, uh, that last round, the 11th round. And uh, I was one down on the other two. Nip and tuck fight against one of the best pound for pound fighters in the world at the time. Um, you know, so it was, uh, I don't know, great, great career. Loved every minute of it. Uh, well, no, that's a lie. I didn't love every minute of it. So that, that's a lie. I love, I love every minute of it. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm happy every every minute of it happened the way it happened because it shaped it the way it did. But um, there, was, there were times when it was difficult, it was hard, and I doubted myself. And I, uh, it's like the devil and the angel, you know, the self doubt, the fear, a failure, not as good as I thought. And then you've got the other one. Now you are, keep going, don't give in, stick with it, perseverance. And, and it is, you know, you just got to keep going. And it's, um, but no, I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change a thing. Well, maybe the decision in Germany, but other than that, and, and, it's, and maybe some of the injuries. But but listen, the the the, um, the the good massively massively outweighed the bad, and um, it was uh, no. I'm very 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 satisfied, very grateful. Um, it all happened. I um, I know the mistakes I made. Uh, I didn't. I didn't live the life in between fights like I should have done, but that's only my fault. No one else is, you know. Um, and that's okay too because I was growing up. You're a young man. You make mistakes, and it's, you know they, there's two sayings: you can't put an old head on young shoulders, and it can't put an old head on young shoulders. And youth is wasted on the young, and they are so true, and they are massively applied to me. And uh, I had great advisors, I had great counsel, Brian Peters. Did right by me. Gave me great advice. Uh, so Frank Warren did good for me. We had, we, we had, uh, I was with Frank three different times. Uh, had a quirky enough relationship, but it, but 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 he was a brilliant promoter when I turned pro with him, and he, he uh, had some great nights with Frank Eddie. Listen, I wish Eddie could have come along earlier in my career, but we, I had some. Uh, you know, right at the end of the career, I was I was done really. But I wasn't in love with the sport anymore. I didn't really. Have the motivation anymore, but but uh, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed that final phase with Eddie because he was so easy to deal with. He was such a good promoter. His energy, his charisma, his personality. Matt Troop, such an unbelievable company to to be involved with. So honest, so uh, just great people. Um, so very very lucky, very grateful um, to to have been so blessed to have have come across so many great people and and, and people that I learned so much from. Not, not just about boxing, but you know, you, you're growing. You're, you're growing as a person as well during your career. So you, you know, you're getting wiser. You, get, you make mistakes. Uh, you do things you shouldn't have done. But it's all all part of your growth and your development. As a, not just a fighter, but as a person. And uh, it's um, but the but the yeah, I've lost my point. You know, the young England days that they 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 were they were. Right. I mean, Madison Square Garden, brilliant. So Patrick's Day sold out. Unbelievable, pound for pound. One of the best in the world, you know, unbelievable, unbelievable. Big billboard in Times Square for six weeks. Me, Martinez, unbelievable. But the young England days, the, the boxing, you know, when you're when you're eight, 17, 18, and you're travelling around the world, boxing internationally with, with your pals, hard to beat that, to be honest.
I can see obviously the, the, the small and as you're thinking back to to your to your younger days as an amateur. Just a final question on you all. I can imagine that away from boxing and training, whilst you was out and about in different cities around the world, you'd have you'd have got up to some more mischievous antics. Anything that you can share with us? Any any little secrets that you can get let us know that you and the rest of the guys would have gone up to? I'll say too much. I won't give it all away. <laughs> I, was, I won a gold medal in Hungary back in 2000 in a place called e Eger or Eger. And uh, we were flying out till the Monday morning and it was a heat wave. So the box was in the morning. So by one o'clock in the day, we were finished. I'd won the gold medal. And um, can you see me? Yeah, I got you back. Yeah. I'd won the gold medal. And um, anyway, we. You know, I, I didn't even drink at this point, but the, I, I, I never drank. I had a drink, I might have drank a couple of times in my life, but never really drank. You know, maybe a few smart voices because I hated the taste of alcohol. I never, and I never thought I was ever going to drink, but some of the other lads were drinking. So I was like, oh, well, if you drink, I'll, I'll have a few. And anyway, we ended up get, I ended up getting steaming and drinking all these tequila cocktails. I, don't, I can't even remember anything. I won't, all I remember, I'm in the club dancing, and the next thing I remember is I'm waking up in my room and I still feel really drunk. And, I've got, and a mate of mine, who was, who was my roommate, Femi Fientola from Bradford, um, looked pissed and he was laughing. So I'm like coming to, but a bit all over the place. And I was going, what are you laughing at? And he was going, you last night? I said, why, what? He said, don't you remember the fight? And I was like, no, what fight? He said, you're joking. He said, look in the mirror. So I've got out of the bed, still a bit pissed, walked over to the mirror. My lip was out here. And I've gone like this, and the one of that was black and blue, back right to the, you know, like my tonsils, yeah. it's completely split open and black and blue. And then I've looked down my body and I've got all cuts and scratches and everything. And I was like, what the fuck happened? And he was like, ah, he said, you, he goes, you caused murder. He said, you took all your clothes up in the middle of the club. We got thrown out. We nearly got killed. The doorman chased us up the streets with bats. He said, uh, he goes, you wait till you see the Irish coaches. He said they were going mad. Anyway, I won't, I'll leave it there. That's <laughs> one, one day I'll tell the story. But all, all I will say was, there was a lot of chaos that night. <laughs> <laughs> and there were, there were police at the hotel the next morning. And I was like, and I don't remember any of it to this day. I don't remember any of it. I'm sure we'll have a few comments wanting to know more there, Matt, but obviously we'll move away from those amateur experiences and onto your professional career. Let's just talk about the transition. How did you find the changing style between amateur to professional? Uh, not difficult because I always had a pro style. You know, I, I, always, um, I was quite aggressive. I threw, you know, I was combination puncher, body puncher. Um, like I say, I was always, I was always around professionals. As an amateur, right from, from the soon as I turned, uh, as soon as I went in the boxing gym, I was um, I was around people that that were pro minded, the pros, the Paul Ramsey, Mark Ramsey, Anthony Maynard. Um, you know, they were all boxing in the um, it was for small heat, and they still trained at small heat, so we'd spar with them. So I never, and then I, like I say, even when I turned professional, I'd been when I was boxing for him, I was training at Paddy Lynch's gym. I was sparring with Anthony Maynard, Ward Rutherford. Uh, even Robert McCracken and Spencer McCracken, I spoke with those guys as well. So it was, I, I was, I had a pro style always as an amateur, you know, so um, it, was, it wasn't difficult for me at all. Let's talk about obviously your, your little bit of a time Matt, with uh, Buddy McGirt. Buddy McGirt, very well known in the boxing world, former Hassan Rockman, Otto Rogatti, amongst many others that he's used to train and work with. What was your experience like working with Buddy? Buddy Buddy's probably one of the most knowledgeable guys you'll ever talk boxing with. You know, great fighter himself, two weight world champion, clever fighter. Um, yeah, re re real, real knowledgeable boxing guy. Um, I think with Buddy, you know, it's it's hard when you're when you're living, you're not living there, and you go in there and you're doing five six weeks. It's hard, really. I think it's not. It, you can't compare that to someone that you've you, you, you're spending a lot more time with. It's because um, you know it takes a few weeks just to get back in sync with each other. Uh, he was absolutely brilliant for the Martinez fight. We spent uh, 10 weeks together in New York and he was spot on. Everything he said to do that I needed to do that would work, worked. And everything he said I couldn't afford to do, he was right about that too, you know. Um, brilliant, brilliant trainer, very knowledgeable. 
um, you know, he's a he's a he, he, he's very textbook. Do you know what I mean? Like he's he's, he's a purist. So, and he, you know, he's, he's a stylist, but he like so he's he's very correct with how things go. But so sometimes if I if you already got a bad habit. I and mean, then you're trying to wind that out. It's hard in six weeks. Do you know what I mean? It's difficult, but he's no, he's a, and he's a good guy, but a real great, great character. Everyone on the boxing scene uh, knows Buddy. Nice family, a spider with his son. Uh, yeah, no, good, good, uh, good things to say about Buddy. And, uh, you know, he's a good trainer. You know, he knows his stuff. So you mentioned Sergio Martinez there as well. Just also on him, he's looking at his comeback now. He wants to get back into the ring. What are your thoughts on it? I don't think you should do it. I think he looked absolutely shut to bits in his last couple of fights. Um, I think he's, uh, you know, you don't know who gets better when they get older. It doesn't happen. Do you know what I mean? You know, you get it. It's it's a mad one getting old because you can see it better than you ever could. I, I'm like that now. I'm obviously calling fights week in, week out with Sky and I can see things better. And I think, God, if I was training now or I was fighting now, this is what I would do. I would take my time so much more you know, patience. I never had no patience in anything. I had no patience when it comes to negotiating for a fight. And I had no patience when I was in the ring. I was like 100 mile an hour, too emotional instead of just being patient. But that's something that's come with age. You know, I'm patient now. But like I say, youth is wasted on the young. So as we get older, we can see it better than we ever could. We understand it better. We can read it better. We're more knowledgeable. But our body can't do what our mind tells it to do, you know, or it might be able to do it on the back, you know, it might be able to do it on the back, but when you're in that competition, sparring, fighting, it's different. It doesn't happen. And, you know, it's, uh, that, that, uh, you know, it's the, um, you can't do it. It's just, it's just, I, I wouldn't advise. I, I hate it when I read these things about old fighters coming back. I just think, I know, I know it's going through your head. I know where you're at in your mind. But it won't happen on the night. Physically, it won't. It won't happen. Your body won't be able to react. You know, it might. You can hit the bags. You might be hard. You get a good workout. You might feel good. But you're talking in, in world class sport. You're talking split seconds. You're talking half yards. That's the difference between winning and losing. That's the difference between slipping a shot and getting hit smack straight on the nose. You know what I mean? Or, or, or on the chin or whatever. You're talking minute fractions. That's what separates winning from losing, getting caught and not getting caught. And, you know, it doesn't get better. As you get older, you're more experienced, you're more knowledgeable, you're more patient. You can see things a lot better. And that's when, that's when your mind can play tricks on you. But your body won't react. You know, they say you can't pull the trigger. That's the same boxing. You see that with fighters that are coming to the end. And, a good, you know, a, a good trainer who knows his fight will know that. You can't pull the trigger. All that means is you get in there, you're into the position, you can see it, and you've hesitated, and it's gone. You've missed it. You couldn't pull the trigger at that time. When the, when, the, when you got into that position, you made that move, you made him miss, or whatever you did, you got there, and it was there, and then you had to do it. And you hesitated for that split second. You couldn't pull the trigger, you missed it. It doesn't happen, and that's what happens when you're old. And it's, it's a horrible realisation. It's a difficult thing to accept. But... I think the ones that do accept it and then, you know, maybe it doesn't happen straight away, but, you know, eventually reflect on their career and find peace and gratitude and satisfaction with what they achieved and their, you know, what they, the whole journey. I think they're the ones that move on to, 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 to a, a peaceful, happy, fulfilled life. We're seeing it not just obviously with Sergio, but with, with, the old school heavyweights looking at coming back, you know, Shannon Briggs, Mike Tyson, uh, many, many others have been talking about making comebacks recently. What's been your thoughts on them as well? Why do you think it is that boxers want to return? Is it just they're, they're trying to fill a hole that they haven't been able to fill since their retirement? What What do you think it is? Yeah, absolutely. They're trying to fill that void. They're trying to fill, you know, boxing's. Li- it leaves a massive void, you know. It, you know, as a, fo- a footballer, it'll leave a void. You know, footballers can probably still play football, you know, at a lower level, and then play as a hobby. You know, boxing, it, it doesn't really happen like that, does it? it you know, you get punched in the head. It, it, it's, it's dangerous. It's not good for your health. 
you know, you could be you could be fifty odd and play for an over fifties football side, you know, five side or the Masters or whatever. You know what I mean? It's yeah. it's it's it, it's less where boxing, you know, all you've done, and it, I think it's an individual sport boxing as well. So it's lonely, but it's 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 um it's lonely, but it, it's amazing as well when you win because it's all you. It's you, it's all your glory. You're not sharing that glory. You are part of the team's glory. It's your glory, and equally, when you lose, it's rock bottom. It's it's, it's a pure agony because it's you're, you're taking that whole loss on your own shoulders. But it's you know the boxing. It's it's such. It's not just the boxing. It's not just the fight. It's 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 the build up. It's the negotiation for the fights. Is this fight going to get made? Let's talk about it. He's what's he offering there? To, if he wins that, he could get it. You know, this is going on for weeks before the fight gets agreed, and then the contract comes signed, and then you start training. This, you know, it's constantly going on. So it's not just. Uh, it doesn't just take up those weeks where you're in the gym. It's the thought processes. It's it's all your thoughts and and everything, and it leaves a void. It leaves a massive void, and. Um, it's uh, it's filling that void with, but I, but I think people that can find a, I, I think it might be Sugar Ray Leonard. I read a piece about him, and he said how uh, he'd um, you know, he struggled. He made, kept making the comebacks, and he, he, you know, he said, look, you know, he tried, he tried to uh, drink and drugs, women, or whatever. I can't, maybe I think he said women. I, I, maybe it wasn't, but you know, he said he, he tried to fill it with external things. Tried to fill that void. You know, but it, it took him a while to realise and accept that he wasn't the fighter he was, but more so that nothing was going to fill that void, really. And he just had to accept that. And what was it? Don't cry that it's over. Smile that it happened. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing. You know, we've all... What's the point in dreaming about this journey as a child and as a teenager and as a young adolescent and as a young man, what's the point in dreaming about this journey to live the journey to then be depressed after? Do you know about it? Do you know what I mean? It's like, you've got to be grateful. But like you said, don't cry that it's over. Smile that it happened. It was never going to be forever. You know, most fighters by 35 or before they're done. You know, you get to that and you've, you had a great one of it. Be, and you know, you had a great one, and it would be grateful for all the highs, the lows, all of it, because it shaped your journey and it made you who you are. And, but, you know, you see a lot of fighters struggle with, with, with addictions and different things because they're trying to replace it, they're trying to chase that high. You know, that high. There's no, there's no high like boxing. There'll be not, there's no drug in the world that will, that will hit that high. There's nothing like it. You know, that, that high when, you went, that, when you've got all that fear, that fear of failure beforehand and those doubts and people read, you know, out and you're in this and that and you go through this training camp where you're bearing your soul day in day out and you're having bad spars and good spars and all this you know going through breaking pain bar after pain barrier the build up to the fight the nerves and then you know you win and everyone there that crowd, there's, nothing, there's no drug in the world like that as high as that so that that's going to leave a void in your life you know what i mean and it's uh it, it, it's just, it's filling it, and it's, it, but I think coming to peace with your own career, like you say, don't cry, you know, being, being happy with, with what, how it went, you know, accept, you know, being grateful that it happened the way it happened, the highs and the lows, you know, and, and get to a place in your life where, where you're at peace with it all, and, and grateful for it all, and that you are smiling, that it happened, not crying that it's over, but it's a shame when you see old fighters struggling going on, and you know, financially as well, some of them don't invest their money too good. And they, they, what else are they going to do? They don't know anything else, you know. And and that 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 listen, every fighter has got an ego. Well, you know, some bigger than others, but everyone's every, all fighters are proud men. You have to be to do what you do. And you know, the one up, you know, some fighters that they don't have too many options after they finish and they've got a load of money and they hit the real highs. And then they spend their money. What are they going to do? You know, then it's, 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 listen, boxing history is littered with the rags to riches to rags stories. I'm very lucky and fortunate that, you know, I, I, did, I, did, I did well in boxing. You know, I didn't do anywhere near as good as some people, but I did well. I did better than, than most. And, and, I, and I invested it because I, I earned a lot of money early on when I was like 19, 20. I, by 22, I was, Skins had a few injuries, and that was the best thing that ever happened to me. 
because then when it when it you know when it came back around and the big folks with the glove king and the martinez and all these people i never touched a penny of that money all that money got invested um so i'm lucky that that, that happened and, and i'm lucky to be working with sky sports calling the fights and you know, I'm still involved in boxing, so I'm still getting my, uh, my my fix. You know, I still get my weekly fix. I, I lo- I'm back in love with the sport as much as I ever was, to be honest. Um, and I'm, I'm totally at peace with my own career. I'm grateful for for it all. Um, and I love I love still being a part of it. I love that I get to be involved, calling the fights. I love I love the boxing. I'm, I'm passionate, but I'm back as passionate as boxing as I, I was probably when I turned professional. Loving it again. One thing on a trainer front before I do ask you about a few fights in your question in your uh, career, sorry. Um, your your link up obviously with Joe Gallagher. Joe's someone who I've got to know over the past couple of years, and I've got to know everybody in his camp. What what was it like working with Joe? Why in particular did you feel that you found your home at, at, at Gallagher's gym? Um, Joe's coming and got this us against the rest of the world mentality, and that small Heath had that. And I think I've got that in me a little bit. Like I can back myself into a corner and think everyone's against me, or I could then, not now. But I, but I, at the same time, I thought that worked for me. Um, and Joe's like that. You know, he's, Joe's Joe's a driven man. You know, Joe is a driven man. And I was driven. You know, I was I was driven to. Don't get me wrong, I had me not in between, but you know that that's a bit, had a different kind of drive. But no, it, but you know for the for the ten weeks I was driven. I was eating, sleeping, breathing. Nothing else mattered. I didn't care about anything. Just winning and just being the best I could. And um, you know he pushed me. There were days when you know you. What did he say to me when I went? When he said, and this is for want of a better terminology, because you need to get the eye of the tiger back. And. I got it. I went with Joe. I had it. I don't, I don't think Joe taught me anything about boxing technically. I don't, I don't think he disagreed. I don't think technically boxing or anything like that. But let's talk man money. But I don't think I don't think Alex Ferguson probably taught Eric Cantona anything about football. But he was a man manager. Man management, you know, different person, you know. And, and I think for me, Joe's personality, Joe's drive suited me he, he was a good man manager for me you know he uh, he pushed my buttons you know he made me days i didn't want to do it he pushed me to do it um like you say and, and those that, that's that i think joe was a really good man manager for me i was super fit with him but more importantly my head was in the right place i was i was anytime i was walking to that ring with joe i knew we ticked every box i was super fit nothing could have been done better and i was ready you know apart from things outside our control, like an illness or an injury. But, you know, in terms of, you know, you know, he, yeah, just, just man management, I think, with Joe, he was, uh, he was, he, he was the, um, he, he suited me. 